What's up, everybody? And welcome to a new episode of Rocket Live. I want to welcome you all right now. Thank you so much for those of you who are joining us live right now, uh, wherever you're watching this, uh, possibly LinkedIn, possibly Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for watching. And for those of you that will be uh, watching or listening to the replay of this, well, welcome to the show. We appreciate you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, I am really psyched to have my guest on today, Joyce Gerber from the Canna Mom Show. Welcome to Rocket Live. I'm so happy. I'm so happy uh, you could we we could put this together and, and finally get you on. All right, I love a good guitar solo, so I was rocking out to your opening. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. Yeah, um, you know, got 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 to start with a little little bit of energy, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I am the mother. I was the um, little known fact about the Cannon Mom show is I was the general manager of our small rock band named Angry Toddlers. My son had a band from the time he was seven till he was nice. 18. And now he's gone off into the world. I can say he's a professional musician. Legit. Complete <laughs> pro. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Wow. So you so you uh you know, you have such a storied history. And now uh and now I have just learned that you can add some uh music uh, some band management to your uh to your uh repertoire <laughs> you, you live in all you live long enough you do a lot of things <laughs> that is that is that is the truth that is 100 percent the truth um well i i'm really psyched to have you on today and there's a lot to talk about so of course uh for those of you watching live uh please feel free to chat or ask any questions as we go just use that little comment box and we will bring them up as we go if you have any questions uh, we we love this is always about our, our audience participation. So if you feel so inclined to ask us a question, please throw it in the chat box and we will answer it live right here. And for those of you listening to the recorded version of it, sorry, but you can still ask questions because you can connect with Joyce uh, in the show notes below. Uh, all the links will be there. So obviously, if you'd like to connect with Joyce and ask her any questions at all, feel free to do that by using the links below. And if you like what you hear and you want to support the show, please head over to uh, my Buy Me a Coffee page over at buymeacoffee.com backslash C Vaglio. Once again, all those links are in the show notes and the video description below, as well as other fun little things to click on. Uh, but let's get all that out of the way. Let's dive into it. Joyce Gerber, The Can of Mom Show. Uh, I am so happy we got connected and you've got such a, a such an interesting background. So let, let's just let's kick this off because you have a background, um, as I've learned in, in law, right? You're you're an attorney. So where did and because I want to get into the whole you're a professional podcaster. So I love because a lot of the folks that listen to the show, I, my audience is very much like, hey, I've got entrepreneurs, I got business owners, I've got creators, you know, mm -hmm. I've got folks in the cannabis. I mean, it's from all over. So, you know, I love how I mean, one of the things we talk about a, lo a lot is how people blend their different professions and do the things they want to do. And, you know, and you everybody finds their way of, of course, being creative and doing that. So I love that you are an attorney and then you've bridged all that and, and put your passions together and you have the podcast now. But take us back to the attorney start of things. Uh, so let's let's step into the time machine <laughs> hd wells bloop, 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 and go back into time well, this space used to be my daughter's bedroom so we're way back in time <laughs> <laughs> we took a step back step a sec um so thank you chris for inviting me on this is exciting sure. so um when i tell my own cannabis journey story i generally begin by saying that cannabis is not my natural habitat meaning I am a middle-aged lady. I have um, two children in their 20s. I've been married for almost 30 years. I'm an attorney by training. I used to be a family law attorney. I was pretty mean. Um, I play tennis. I wear pearls. And I believed all the stuff that they told us about cannabis, really. And I had right. um, an experience. So in 2000, you know, and I was, I consumed cannabis, but it was more mm -hmm. like, you know, my kids were little. You could drink wine. I could stop at the right. liquor store before I daycare, you know, it was almost expected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, you know, it was yeah. a different time. <laughs> but you know, my friends and I once in a while, we'd find like a bud. I think it's like a joke. We felt like we get a bud. I'm not quite sure. We'd go to someone's beach house away from the family. Right. We'd smoke it. We'd have a great time and then drink our wine and think about, was that okay? I don't know. So, you know, that was sort of my experience with it. Um, 2016, I went out to Denver, Colorado with my husband. I call it my cannabis awakening. 
Mm -hmm. um, we met, we did a private tour with a woman named Goldie Solidar, who's got a business out there called City Sessions, if anyone's out there. And she took us on a private tour. She took us to a dispensary. She took us to a growth facility where I met, you know, the MBA who knew everything about the cannabis and could explain things. And mm -hmm. we took a picture in the drying room and she started telling me about the history, which right. I didn't know anything about. And it was on that uh, trip, really, that I understood everything I knew about cannabis was just wrong. Everything right, I knew right. was wrong. <laughs> right. Everything I knew, everything I thought I knew is completely wrong, which, well, you know, kind of like that's kind of, yeah. it's kind of par for the course. I mean, and this, this is how then you find out the, the real the real story. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we came back to Massachusetts. I live in Massachusetts and uh, my kids are teenagers. You know, my joke is that we came home and we said, kids, <laughs> everything we know about cannabis is wrong. And we're psyched. <laughs> Right. Like, we don't wow, know what happened. Really to <laughs> this is great. This is exactly what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Um, you know, we're <laughs> planning on ever working in it. Um, and then 2016, uh, Massachusetts, the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we voted to approve adult use, the first in New England, mm -hmm. which I was surprised at. I lived here my whole life. I thought we were Puritans, but every, <laughs> everyone was on the pod, as I'm finding out. And yeah. um, at the end of the year, a contract position I was working on ended. And then I literally just became an invisible middle-aged woman, despite my education and experience, because I had taken time off to care for my kids, which mm -hmm. is a very common story of women my age. Um, so, you know, this is sort of how it started. Um, right. I didn't plan on going into cannabis podcasting. I thought when I was trying to transition into a new area of work, I would go from family law to cannabis law. That was mm -hmm. the original idea, because I could see all the law firms are setting up new literally cannabis divisions in their law firms and it was right. all new law. So that was the original idea. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no. And, and I, and I, I find it, uh, you know, it's great because it's like everybody has their own story. Right. And even, you know, I, I feel like any industry or any kind of scene of um, culture that you wind up getting into, it always is like, I started here and wow. now I'm here. <laughs> and, you know, even like in filmmaking, which is where I, I came up as a filmmaker, most people who are in filmmaking didn't start off in filmmaking at all. You know, it was always like, well, I was doing this and I helped a friend out. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then I got sucked into the into the film industry or, you know, whatever, whatever kind of creation story, you know. Right. And I, I always find that so fascinating with everybody. I, 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 even the podcast, I didn't even I mean the truth right. is I didn't know what a podcast was. I'm an NPR, I get my newspaper delivered to my house lady. I, I mean, seriously, yeah. I'm very old school and I'm like, there are people who choose to listen to their own podcast. I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> But um, during my sort of adventure, like I took about a year to learn about cannabis when I thought I would go into the industry. And mm -hmm. the joke is I went into it for money, but now I'm an advocate. Now yeah. I wear like cannabis attire. Right, now, now, now you're now you're you're all in. Like you're you're I'm full on. You're um, immersed. <laughs> yeah, anyways, I'm an advocate now. Anyway, so right. I was looking for a job. I was learning the history. I was meeting people in the industry, and I end up. And it's a new industry, so you know, yeah. just trying to figure out who even had money or who was like hiring was one another issue. Yeah. And um, I ended up working for a cannabis a media. It was a podcast media company that wanted to produce only cannabis podcasts, mm -hmm. and I was hired to be an executive producer for one of the cannabis podcasts, and that's how I started. Wow. Okay. See, yeah. And I and I and I think that see that's something very interesting too because this is where a lot of people, and I'm sure you get, I get, you know. How did you, and everybody's got a podcasting story. How did you start podcasting? How did yeah. you get into podcasting? By mistake. And, <laughs> and, th and there you go. It's like it's mm -hmm. by mistake or because you wanted to do something like, you know, I started podcasting a few years back with my buddy, uh, Victor. We had a geek podcast called Galaxy Geeks and we literally started and he was already doing podcasting, but like we literally started it because we were just having these conversations constantly yeah. on, on messenger about comic books and star Wars. And right. it was just like, well, why don't we just start a podcast about talking? We're, we're literally already talking about this. So let's you just do it. Out loud. Yeah. And that's <laughs> what we started doing for like five years. And then eventually, you know, like all, like some creative projects, it just kind of fizzles out. But then, you know, you start something new and you, you move learn on something like, new. I mean, I didn't yeah. know, I didn't know how to make a podcast. No one knows how to do I mean, I think that's the beauty of podcasting yeah. and get this together is that they're literally new industries and nobody knows what they're doing. So you can right. do it any way you want. So I, understand now a podcast is really more of a um a vehicle driver yeah you being a marketing guy i have what i've done with my podcast is i've created a brand yes yeah exactly a hundred percent and i think that's really important because it's something that comes up a lot with you know folks who podcast and like listen it, it, 
you know, not everything has to be monetized, right? I, it's, it's that to me, that's a choice, right? Some people just, I literally want to podcast just because it's fun and it gives me a reason to talk about things like, you know, Star Wars or Marvel or, you know, cannabis or whatever it is, yeah. new music. I just want to be able to do that and that's it. And that's my aspirations for it, right? But then there becomes a point where it's like, well, you know, I've kind of built a following. People kind of like this, you know, why shouldn't I? you know, take it to the next level and, be, and begin to like really give it a brand, really like give it yeah. a life of its own and, and, where it yeah. kind of turns into something a little bit more than just a hobby, so to speak, yeah. you know? I, I mean, I mean, I will say going back to entrepreneurship yeah, yeah. and cannabis and women, is, there are so many women in this industry who are hardcore entrepreneurs. Yeah. Maybe that's not how they started out. I will say of, I've interviewed over 200 women at this point. I have over 120 shows out, but almost universally, these women have healed themselves. Mm-hmm. Or healed someone they love and they are in this for the long run and they become right. entrepreneurs because they want to be the people they needed so they're becoming business coaches and they're creating products and they're becoming healthcare professionals and they're doing all sorts of things to come into this industry but they're really entrepreneurs which is really something that's needed and the thing about cannabis is that it's everything the real world has but upside down so any skill set you have we need you because yes. you're a specialist in this industry from lawyers to marketers, to product developers, to scientists, to everyone, because this is so new and it's so it's being built so weirdly, like state by yeah. state, county by county, with no yeah. guidelines, like no broad, no right, and no banking. Like, how are you supposed to make money in an industry that doesn't have banking? So <laughs> exactly, it's a strange place to be, but I know it's the future. I know that we are going to create a whole new, you know, carbon to cannabis mm -hmm. world because hemp. When nobody, when nobody even talks about hemp as much as they should, but this is really what's going to change. This is really what's going to change the earth if we really invest our energy and time in it. Yeah, and and I and I a hundred percent agree with you. And I and just to go back to one of the points you just said, which is, you know, hey, we need you. This is it. Yes, your everybody's skill sets because what everybody has to remember is that you know, like any other business owner <laughs> or business, like you need. The services you need yeah. people to help you grow your business so having people who have expertise and have talents in these different areas of business is 100 needed and mm -hmm. the more quality people we have involved in in the industry the faster and stronger this this entire you know this this new emerging market is going to uh mm -hmm. is going to be you know because yeah. it really is a strength in numbers thing and I think that, and it is, you said a state by state thing because you can go to the next state over and it's different there and the state, the state next to that, you know, you could be surrounded by states that all have a, have a legal market, but yet, you know, some states don't even have a, a medicinal uh, program yet. So it's, it's really a bizarre thing until we get it, you know, mandated on a federal level and all that. And yes, banking, <laughs> great point is like, we have an industry with no banking. I mean, there's some banks, but not not on a not on a nationwide level. You know, none of the giant again, banks. Are big America, banks. America, our gym yeah. used to be making money. Like that was like literally a thing. We don't right. give anybody anything. We don't provide healthcare, but we used to be able to make money. We should be able to do this. Yeah, <laughs> we should be able to do this. We should be able to do it. We should be able to do this. And and I think slowly but surely we are. Things are. You know, it's happening. Obviously, it's taken forever, you know, but it's, 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 you know, but it's moving. Yeah. But this is a political level too. Like, you know, who's yeah. whispering in the ears of the politicians? How are these, you know, this is, you know, this touches everything from criminal justice to cosmetics. Yeah. And it can't just be about big money. You know, I joke about this is Absolutely. my, I went into this for money, but this can't look like every other industry. There's a lot of reparations that have to happen because this war on drugs was very bad mm -hmm. and for very bad reasons. And we were all brainwashed into it. And now we got to reverse that as well. And that's kind of where the cannon moms come in. I see them across the country, the ones who are healing themselves and their children, and they're changing the next generation. The next generation will not grow up with the same ideas that we had. Yeah, no, exactly. They, they won't because of, you know, what, like you said at the top, right? Like I, I, I have the whole story that what we were taught is wrong. I've got the real story. And now, you know, what we know to be true is getting, is getting passed on. Like knowledge should be like the right knowledge, the correct knowledge. So, you know, the next generation's coming up, you know, hopefully a lot of stigmas are gone. Hopefully a lot of, you know, everything from political level to the legal level to, you know, everything begins to just go away because it just isn't part of like. But it's, nation, just, it's, a, it's you know, a story, you know, we're yeah. very, 
we're run by stories. The world is run by stories. Mm -hmm. Religion is run by stories. Everything is run by stories. And these stories are really powerful. Yeah. And these are what are going to change the narrative. You know, it's not going to come from the top down. Our politicians suck. I can't explain it. You know, that's another level that people have to be out there advocating in their states, like friends in Texas, you know, all over the country where it's right. still pretty dangerous. And especially kind of back to the moms, you know, you can lose your children to children's services. I used to be a family law attorney. People will use this against you in court. Yeah. So yeah. This is a really kind of tragic thing. In addition to these children aren't necessarily getting their medications in the schools because the schools aren't on board either. Yes. You'll give them an opiate or a Ritalin or whatever else you get prescribed, but you can't take a CBD oil. So mm -hmm. it's it's all of us sort of fighting for the individual properties that we want and this collective will change, but it's a weird narrative that came down to us that we bought into and it's up to us to break it. Yeah, a hundred percent. I agree. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about the podcast itself because I think the story of how you got there is really important, but you, you do, you said you have over 120 episodes of the show and, uh, and unfortunately I have not listened to all 120 episodes, but I will tell you that I I've listened to a couple episodes already. And you know, I, I, what I like about your show in particular, is there's a lot of cannabis podcasts out there and you know, and everybody's got their own thing and I think it's great. That's what it should be. Everybody has their own voice. Uh, but I like particularly how you, you frame up a lot of, you know, the discussions you're going to have with, with your guests. And I think that you have a very, like, I like your style. It's just a very, like, um, it seems off the cuff, but it's very conversational, which I always like because I, I, I appreciate podcasters who kind of follow their format of questions they ask. And I, and I totally like, that's their thing. I like that style that you, that you use a lot because I feel like I'm a lot more part of the conversation. Like you seem to ask the questions that I'm already thinking of. All right. And so I, I, so, so have I told you this? So I want to be the Terry Gross. No, you didn't tell cannabis. me that. <laughs> you didn't tell me this. No, you didn't say it. Okay. So, so here I, it is. I, I have the NPR vibe. That's what I listen to all day. I listen to Terry Gross every single day. I listen to her breathe. Like, I, <laughs> yeah. I was interviewing David Sedaris today, and it was such an amazing interview, Ooh. which it was a very serious interview. He just wrote sure. a, a, um, a new series of stories about his father, who was not a very nice man. Ooh. And it was a very serious, and at the end of it, you could hear her emotion in it. She's like, thank you for being serious. But again, I'm like, that's, I think Terry's my friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been yeah, listening well, to her for 20 years. I think that, you know, yeah. But yeah. it's just, I think she's very, I try to copy that effortless effort to make it feel like it's a conversation. Yeah. And I, I, it's what I think for me and what, you know, everybody's different. Every, everybody listens to a show differently and people latch on to shows for different reasons. For me, I like the shows that tend to have that more like I feel like I'm right there, like literally right there, yeah. like listening and and also like somebody's already thinking of like that next question, but really listening to what the person's saying and just letting the conversation go and building off that. And I feel like that that is an important and for me. It's just a much more engaging conversation. So that's what I really enjoy about your show in particular and I also, so another cool thing, so I listened to oh. your, your latest episode um, today, and that was, how does it feel? Oh, yeah. You know, that Alan Alda listened to your, like, is a, it seems like a fan of the show. I mean, when you were telling that story about MASH, I'm like, oh, my God, exactly. I remember watching MASH with my grandparents. I still watch MASH. Like, I, you know, I, I love that show. And I always, I, and I'm like, oh, my God, that's so cool. Yeah, so um, Sarah Chase, she has she's at a federal, she's working at a federal level on federal regulations, and she had a she's a very elevated resume. When she came on the show, I'm like, you sure? <laughs> <laughs> but she um, she produced and ran Alan Alda's podcast and passed on her interview to him, and he said I did a good job, and I I was verklempt, as they yeah. say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's very cool. I, I really, I really <laughs> think that's a great. But it's like it's so nice. It's like just wild to like know that someone like Alan, Alan Aldo like listened to the show and like was really complimentary towards it. You know, because he's and that it's getting I, out there again. Yeah, like, you know, I I, out there. I talk about cannabis and women in my daughter's bedroom. Right. I don't have that big of a reach. I don't feel, but apparently my voice is getting out there. And if I can be part of the moving us forward, something adding value, I feel really good about that. Yeah, and I think that's another important point that you're making there too, because I think a lot of people, especially you know newer newer into podcasting, right, 
And I think this this is like anything creative. Like nothing happens overnight. And you can't use the quote unquote the Joe Rogans of the world as a litmus test uh for yeah. like your popular and what's going to happen. And by the way, whether you like Joe Rogan or not, it's not something he did not become an overnight success either. So, you know, I mean, we you just had you have over 120 episodes of of your show already under your belt, still going. Um, and you're just starting to sort of see like a momentum going, you know, message for everybody out there. Like if you really like something and you're very passionate about it, you got to stick with it and you got to keep doing it because it just it's doesn't good, happen it's good, overnight. It's good mom advice. It's just consistency. I mean, I really is. I don't, I don't have any magic formula. I am consistent. I have been, the first year was chaos. Like the first year we did it, it was just like a chaotic experience with a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. We were like Thelma and Louise, but after the first, <laughs> And that it all happened during the pandemic, like during the pandemic. And then I got relegated back to my daughter's bedroom. And, but after we finished that first season, I wasn't sure what to do, right. but people were reaching out to me. So I could see that people wanted to share their story. So then I had to be more, I had to be serious. So, you know, I set it up and it wasn't like, you can come on whenever you want. Like we record the show every Wednesday at 1230. We release it every Thursday. We have a very set, you know, it's not exciting, but it's a set way of doing our social media. You know, we add some stuff extra and mm -hmm. um, I'm just very consistent. I think that's really part of it because people get very excited about podcasting and it seems like it, it takes up a lot of time if you're going to do it right. Right. And once you have your systems in place, you know, it's just what you do, but you have to be consistent and you have to do it over and over again. And then I don't know, at some point it kicks in. I can't, I have no, I can't explain it. <laughs> right. Listen, I, it's, it's, I don't, I think the, the explanation really is, is that you just have to do it and you got to stick with it. And I like, and consistency is key. Like if you're going to do the show every week, put the show out every week. If you're going to do it two times a month, fine. Do it two times a month, whatever it is, just do it and stick with it because then, you know, people learn to expect it. They, they it become, that's how you start to build an audience for things. You know, like I say, it's about bands all the time. Like bands don't just like write two songs and just become hits. Like they got to go out, they got to play. You got to play a lot. You know, it's, it's not, it's not nothing is easy. And if you want any sort of like success, whatever success means for you, you, you got to stick with it. And for you, you know, it's about being very consistent. And I think that that's a good thing for everybody to, to adhere to. But, it's, you know, it's, so I my son is 23. He's a professional guitar player now. Right. He, you know, started playing when he was he picked up a ukulele at like two or something. You know, yeah. he started or started early. So. By the time he was 17 or whatever, he was like, my God, it's taking so long. I'm like, it's just because you've been doing it forever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. Well, there he is. I mean, he's very young. He's only 23, but right. he's been doing this for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, but that's it. You know, you got you got to put in a time to to, to get even good at doing what you're yeah. doing as well. Like it, it just, <laughs> just doesn't happen. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, and so I, I want to ask you a question, too, about about the show. And I. What I really like about the show is that not only is it just cannabis and can a mom focus, but it, it does have, I like the, the, the reoccurring theme though of, of female entrepreneurs or female professionals in this industry in particular. Um, mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that because I, I think what's important is a lot of the things. And like I said, I haven't listened to all 120 episodes, but I really like the conversations where you dig in and, and you really talk more about that and what's, um, where, where it was in the past, where it is presently and what you're seeing sort of in the future of it. And I like these conversations. So talk a little bit about that, that focus and that, and that messaging. I mean, so say again, we're trying, you know, we're on a mission to crush the stigma around cannabis and caregivers. I'm not just moms, caregivers. We don't, right. you know, right. our country, you know, we just don't take care of caregivers. <laughs> That's a problem. You know, so we're crushing the stigma because when the caregivers are taking care of themselves, they can take care of others. And this image of the stoner, or the stoner mom or whatever it was before was that right. this it was a human being a caregiver who wasn't doing their job and i want to show these women who are not just functioning they are excelling like they're good parents and they're good partners and they're building businesses in new and exciting ways and they're giving their um employees new ways to think about work so right. i'm 57 i did everything i was supposed to do i went to law school i thought i was going to do the whole thing i got pregnant my third year in law school I still took the bar. I still passed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. after that baby showed up, everything changed for me. 
Yeah. And there are no structures in the world to help me take care of another being. And because the baby came out of me, whatever. So it's, it's a whole generation of women sort of like me who are sort of had to always choose between being a caregiver and being a person who monetized their time, which is not right. Mm -hmm. so I can see there seems to be a new generation of women who saw what we did. You know, Cheryl Sandberg kept telling us to lean in more. We weren't quite sure where we were supposed to lean into. And when we didn't make it, when it didn't function for us, it was very personalized. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to, we are now in an opportunity to create an industry with new rules. Like I was literally told I couldn't do my job at home. Impossible. Right. You can't do your job at home. We don't, we never got any time off to take care of our kids. Like you had to pretend like you didn't really have a sick kid or that you weren't ill, that you didn't have to be taken care of. And I can see these businesses are building like I'll give an example. My, I had a sponsor, Plymouth Armor Group, out here in Massachusetts. Right. A woman run armored cars delivery for cannabis and um, cash. Mm -hmm. Our um, director of um, social media and communications. Um, she got COVID while she was pregnant. Yeah. Oh man. She, she, whatever. She had the baby. She had to be out of work for a very long time. Yeah. Obviously. But this company, they didn't lay her off. They didn't send her home. When she was able to come back at work, they accommodated her and they gave her a raise and they made sure she was taken care of. And that is a different kind of idea of how a business should run. And that'll make people more loyal to your company. Anyway, so I just think of, I right. want to highlight these women who are, it's hard to be in a man's world. I had to function in a litigator world where I had to play by the rules that really disadvantage me. Like I'll never be the meanest person in the room. Right. I just won't be. Yeah. I can pretend and I can try to be that way, but I will never be authentic. And if you can find a space where you can be authentic, be a leader who's vulnerable, like sometimes leaders are vulnerable and sometimes you make mistakes and sometimes you just don't always know the answers. But if you're allowed to create a space, leaders can function very better, much better in that kind of atmosphere. And I think women are trying. I think they're trying to break some of the rules that were created that we always had to fit into that never made any sense. Right. And I, I think that's it's really important to to keep having these conversations about this, because, you know, I think especially depending on where you live in this country, it sort of seems like, well, no, it's it's everything's fine. But it's like, no, once again, you, you go state by state, different industry by different industry, and it's not equal um, and it's not fine, you know, and, and the thing is, you have to keep talking about it and you have to get. um yeah you got to keep the conversations going because it, this is where, you know, it keeps things top of mind and it keeps things, you know, in the light, so to speak, and not like, you know, happening, you know, and if you don't talk about it, nobody knows about it. So again, Correct. I felt like I was very isolated. I felt like I was failing personally because I couldn't kind of keep it all together. I couldn't right. you know, keep my job and keep my marriage together and all of it. So I was the person who dropped out of the world to monetize work, but I didn't actually talk to my friends about it because we're all having the same struggles and it all felt personal. Yeah. And now, you know, now everyone's been home. Everyone sees that taking care of kids is hard. Like when you're, right. I literally had to pretend my kids weren't sick. Like that's not a joke. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't go, if I had to go to court, I would drop them off at daycare and turn my phone off. I mean, these were like literally things that we had to do because we had to make these weird choices. <laughs> yeah. You know I mean? And we weren't healthy. And again, so cannabis is right. supposed to be making us healthier. Women my age and older, we know the least about it, and this will be helping us the most. And if we're healthier, we can help the younger women. And I don't know, I just, I feel like it's like a, it's like a snowball. Like yeah. If we can be healthy, then we can help our daughters be healthy and, you know, so on and so forth. And yeah, just not exactly. Between caregiving and making money, that shouldn't have to be the choice we make. No, absolutely not. It, it shouldn't be in a, if in a, in a perfect world it absolutely should not be a, a, a decision at all. It just should be, yeah. uh, you know, as I guess for, for people that, um, you know, want to listen to the show or maybe interested in, in hearing about the show, you know, for you as, as a, as, as a creator behind it, as the host, you know, having done 120 episodes still going, you know, what are the things that like if you were to pick like one or two things that you really want people to take away from from listening to the show, you know, for you, what what would you what would those be, you know, for for that person who's like, I, I really want you to listen to the show or a few episodes. And if you could walk away with this, like, I feel like I've done my job as as a creator of this of the show. All right. So I'm uh, kind of going back to the mom thing. Like I know my kids never want me to tell them what to do. They need to pretend like they made their own decisions. So I figured this is probably universal. Right. 
I want you to come to my show and not know, you know, I still have friends. Like my mother still doesn't, didn't believe me. I still have people who are very skeptical about this, but come and listen to the show and find someone there. I've, I have women from all across the country. I have women of all different races and religions and experiences. Some of them have healed themselves. Some of them have healed their children. I personally talk about how I found my place in cannabis. There's somebody on the show who you will connect with and you will see their story and you will understand that you don't have to feel shitty. Cannabis can help. <laughs> it could be a salve on your hand that makes you know your arthritis not feel bad. It could be a CBD tincture that maybe takes some of your inflammation away. It could be maybe you do want to consume THC. Maybe you want to try a vape pen. Maybe you want to try an edible. Maybe you're interested in speaking with someone who knows how to cook with cannabis. Right. You know, right. this is a really, or maybe you're just a policy person. Maybe you're so angry about what happened in our criminal justice system. You want to hear somebody talk about what we're going to do about that on the advocacy and policy side. This is a really big industry. When I started the podcast, I remember people asking me if there were enough stories for me <laughs> to share. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, it's not just a bunch of dudes sitting on their couch eating Cheetos. This is not no. what this industry is. And I've had a long haul convincing people in my own family. My mother was very worried about me. She thought I was like going into a drug cartel. She had no idea. <laughs> and I still have friends who will come up to me and say, Joyce, I had a five milligram gummy. And I'll be like, you don't have to whisper. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. It's, it's, uh, it, but and you know what? It happens. It absolutely happens. And I, I think that once again, you know, with, with what you're doing and why I feel like it's important. And we just said it a little bit ago was, you know, you got to have these discussions. You have to talk, you have to put it out there. Uh -huh. And otherwise it's just, you know, it's never going to get noticed. It's no one's ever going to know about this or this person's story. And that's, you know, it is endless stories. I, I mean, it is, you'll, you'll never run out of amazing stories that people have been through um, to, you know, get this, get this plant out there and, and, you know, talk about its benefits and, you know, the fights that have been happening for years and years and years, you talked about the war on drugs and, you know, detrimental and how it's ruined lives. Like it, it's, it's really, um, it's really amazing. The, the depth and the amount of stories that are out there that most people, a majority of people have no idea about, you know, and don't understand like the real story, as you said, of what happened. Yeah. I mean, the politics of it. So I like to talk pot, politics and religion, you know, mix it all together. Mix it together. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Big but again, again, you know, Republicans and Democrats, it's not a marketing scheme. <laughs> These nope. are supposed to be beliefs, ideas, and cannabis is right in the middle. It's right in the middle. It's the thing that we can kind of agree on if we open up our minds, because it is about health and wellness. I've heard priests and nuns and ministers and people in the Jewish faith and all sorts of people are coming together and thinking about how this is actually part of our history. This, right. is, our, this is in the Bible. This is in the Torah. We have 10,000 years of cannabis history. We, this hundred years, this is the anomaly. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. That's well said. Yeah, absolutely. It is the anomaly. It is the anomaly. We are the anomaly. All right. So the idea that this is something that could bring us together, we could heal. I mean, I'm not joking about healing the planet. Yeah. I mean, the whole hemp thing is that, you know, again, I know nothing about the human body and I know nothing about agriculture, but I know that hemp takes toxins out. I know they used it around Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. I know that's been an issue about where you're growing your own cannabis because it could take the toxins out of the soil and that's exactly. not good for you. Yeah. I also know that it could be used for all the things that plastic is being used for, which we don't need anymore. It grows much quicker than trees. It's better than paper. And mm -hmm. we're just literally reversing why this exists in the first place. You know, yep. paper and oil replaced hemp. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, that's it. I mean, there you go. I mean, it's exactly, I like how you said it. It, it is right. It's, and I don't think about it like all that, but it is the anomaly. It is the weird time where, you know, it just turned into like this, like, you know, illegal substance. That's like right up there with like the hardest of hardcore drugs. And it's like, it's a plant that grows in the ground. It's like completely like life saving. And think so, of the power of whoever yeah. made up this narrative. We spread it around the world pretty quickly. You know, people didn't go to CVS to get their medicines. They went onto their field and they got stuff. And cannabis grows everywhere. It literally grows all over the world, all over the world. <laughs> yeah, that that is it is not is not region specific. <laughs> you so you I, can grow I, it I, anywhere. Yeah, the idea that the narrative, the negative narrative, spread so quickly. How do we reverse that? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree a hundred percent. And so what, uh, I, I, I really feel like everybody out there, if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, however, if you've been out there hanging out with us live today, or you're watching this replay, uh, make sure you check out the canna mom show. You can go to, uh, Joyce's website, which is the canna mom show.com. It's up here on the screen, but for those of you listening, you can get the link directly into the show notes. Um, and you can pretty much listen to this podcast anywhere too, right? So you everywhere can get to you listen to your favorite podcast. podcast. Yes, that is true. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Anywhere you listen to your favorite podcast. Yeah. So Joyce, before we wrap up, is there anything else, um, that you'd like to, to say, to talk, to promote, to put out there for everybody who's watching, listening? Well, I am still running a crowdfunding campaign for my season four, which we are starting in September. And one of the items is I'm featured in this book called Courage and Cannabis. It's an anthology of 17 authors from across the country sharing their stories. We've been going and doing book readings. Um, anyone listening in Massachusetts, I'm trying to get into dispensaries. I think this is a good thing to talk about. It's really, again, you might not relate to me, a middle-aged white lady who plays tennis and wears pearls, but there's somebody in here that you <laughs> will relate to. Um, and we're selling these. My, I think they're kind of like pride scarves. They're yeah. like cannabis scars. They're silk with little uh, cannabis leaves on them. So yes. come check out the swag. <laughs> there you go. So for those of you that are listening, uh, yeah, you'll definitely see Joyce. Uh, jo Joyce is wearing uh, some gear, some merch. <laughs> some, uh, so merch, as I say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, some merch. So and you can get all this through the website through uh, the Yeah, so it's all on the website. We have the crowdfunding link is up till the end of June, and then um, maybe I'll just put them on my shop. I don't know. I haven't decided maybe. yet. Maybe I'll sell out. That would be good. <laughs> that would be good. Selling out is always good in that in that yeah. case. <laughs> well, awesome, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for hanging out with us today and uh, talking a bit about your background, sharing everything about the Canna Mom Show. Uh, it is a great show, and I hope everybody gets a chance to check it out. There are 120 plus episodes, so I'm sure there's got to be at least a episode or two that you'll enjoy listening because the stories are really great. And, uh, you know, there's a lot out there and it's, it really is endless. And to hear the stories, true stories, uh, people who are very passionate about, you know, the plant and how it's affected their lives is really important. I think, Joyce, you're, do you're doing great work by, by really uh, having Thank a platform you. for people to share these stories. It's, it's really, it's, we need it. It's important. Very I'm important. Adding value. That is my motto, adding value. Because you know what? We're like butterflies, right? We're out there doing our thing and hopefully together we can do something better. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Well, thank you so much, Joyce, for coming on. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you all so much for watching live, for hanging out with us. If you're watching replay, we really appreciate you uh, watching, uh, watching this, uh, whether you're watching this on YouTube or listening to the audio version, wherever you can get podcasts. Uh, if you like the show and would like to uh, show some support, please head over to buymeacoffee.com backslash cvaglio and feel free to pick a level that you feel most comfortable with. Of course, I would love it if you would like, share, follow, subscribe, wherever you're watching or listening to the show as it helps the show grow and also helps you and my guests, helps my guests get out there more. So please do all the things that you do. Uh, <laughs> all right. I appreciate you all. And we will see you all next time on another episode of Rocket Live. Yeah.